If you could give your former, less experienced self any advice on street photography, what would it be? This was an Instagram thread that I posted a couple of weeks back and I actually got a few interesting replies. So I thought I'd make this video to share my thoughts, go through some of the comments that you guys left on that thread and just discuss further. A big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So the advice that I would give my younger self in street photography is to get into photo books way sooner. I've only been researching and buying and collecting and understanding photo books for like the last two years. And those two years have completely changed my perspective on photography. Photo books have made me think more about the viewer, more about the people consuming the photos, the way the photos are sequenced and displayed, the intention of the photographs. Viewing images on a screen just does not do any of that, really. Photo books, physical photos, prints even, I think that side of photography is way more important than when I first, than what I first realized when I got into photography. Ben Kremin replied, less YouTube, less Instagram, buy film in bulk when it was a lot cheaper, more books, just enjoy it and don't be defined by the self-imposed label. I obviously cannot agree with the less YouTube there because that means you wouldn't be watching my videos. Less Instagram I can agree with. I mean, obviously I'm joking, of course, less of anything digital and online and more of the real world is probably a good thing for most of life, not just photography. The self-imposed label that Ben has mentioned here is interesting and perhaps a lot of street photographers might be hesitant to do street portraits because that's not true candid street photography. And these are just definitions that don't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Maybe you wanna do la uh, wildlife photography, maybe you wanna do landscape stuff, but you're actually a street photographer, so should you be doing it? It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do with your photography because 99% of it is personal for ourselves anyway. It's a hobby, it's a passion, it's a expression. It doesn't matter what other people think of it. However, I don't want that to be confused with other people's opinions don't matter because if I make something that I'm really proud of or I really like and I share it and more people really like it, that is an amazing feeling, but that shouldn't be the intention. Back to what Ben is saying about self-imposed labels. Don't put yourself in a box for the sake of it because you think that's what other people are interested in. Just make whatever you want and have fun with it because 99% of the time, no one's gonna see it. No one cares about it until you decide to share it. But at that point, if you decide to share it, then you're obviously, you think it's good enough to share. Even calling myself a street photographer is weird because I spend all week doing loads of different types of photography. So being a street photographer isn't the only thing I do, but it's the only thing I categorize myself as on YouTube for algorithm purposes and SEO purposes, et cetera, et cetera. But in real life, like these labels don't matter. And I've just gone on for way longer than I thought I should for that point. But anyway, thanks Ben for the comment. Tim D. Jameson said, go wide and get close ASAP. When I started noticing photographs that I really enjoyed, maybe it was from other photographers and friends or in photo books, a lot of them tended to be towards the 28 and 35 millimeter focal lengths, but just using a wide focal length doesn't instantly make your photos better. If you're gonna go wide, I do think getting closer is important. There's just something about the way an image feels when you can tell the photographer was there and involved in the scene. And even if they weren't involved physically interacting with anyone and speaking, for them to get close, they had to somehow maneuver themselves and get in a position to get the story up close with the camera. So there's a level of intensity and impact that a wide angle photograph but closer has compared to a wide angle photograph but stood further away. When the photographer's further away, you can feel it in the photograph. And that's why a lot of street photographers and people on YouTube and people who talk about this kind of stuff might always, you might have heard this before, you know, get wide and get close. It doesn't make your photographs better. It just adds another, it makes them more dynamic because you know the photographer was there and they weren't viewing from afar. And a few months back on the start of this year, actually, I made a video about the 85 millimeter focal length and how most people not most people, maybe that's wrong, but a lot of people use it incorrectly and it's boring and it just lacks any substance because they're so far away and they're relying on bokeh, for, for example. Now, an 85 millimeter can be used really well with the right person, the right photographer's eye, you might wanna say. But the opposite of that boring effect of just being far away and zooming in on someone up close, which I think is boring, you could 
go wide and get close. And that means you have to work really hard to get a compelling image, to get the composition, to get all the subjects placed correctly, to tell a better story or to tell a story at wide and close to your subjects is very difficult. So when it is done correctly, it looks amazing. Now, with that being said, it is very difficult. So going wide and getting close won't instantly make your photographs better, but it does add a challenge to your work and it does the photographs are more likely to have an impact. That's that's what I think. As you can tell, I've not scripted any of this. I just bullet pointed these comments down and then I'm just rifting. So rifting, riffing. Anyway, next point. F22 said, the learning curve is far longer than you think. And as soon as I read this, I immediately thought of the Dunning-Kruger effect. And this is the definition of that. The Dunning-Kruger effect is a cognitive bias in which people with limited competence in a particular domain overestimate their abilities. Jamie Windsor actually made a fantastic video all about this a couple of years ago, so I will leave a link for that video in the description. But when a beginner starts something, their perceived ability and competence of it might be relatively high quite quickly. They might do one or two things correctly, they might be enthusiastic about it, they're excited, they put in a lot of effort, and then they get maybe one or two results and you know their perceived ability of it is very good. I've progressed very quickly. But then as you keep going and keep making work and keep doing more, your perceived ability dips because that old saying, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know, kind of comes into play. And this happens with every facet of life, I think, when you're improving and learning something new, which then kind of leads into imposter syndrome at the other end of the scale, because you've been doing this thing a long time, and you know that there's a lot more to this than you first realized. And even if you are making something of value and something important and something worth sharing, you're still not sure about it yourself because you've been doing this a long time, you know it's more complicated than you first anticipated. So it's an interesting scale and this definitely happens with photography. A photographer might pick up a camera, the camera might be really good for example, or they pick up a really nice lens, they get that shallow depth of field, maybe they shoot 85 millimeter, joking a little bit here. But they think they're taking good photographs until they realize what a good story is or what actually good composition looks like or they understand light a lot better. Their, their competence dips or their perceived ability dips and they think, oh, there's way more to this than what I first thought. Anyway, that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. And I like that F22 mentioned this because especially with photography, the learning curve is far longer than you think. I would just add one more point to this. And this isn't science or well-documented theory what i'm about to say next this is just my opinion but in the photography world my friends and photographers that i think are making good stuff they're like three to five years in before they start finding their groove that's going to be different for everyone but just something i've observed and for me personally it was like year three or four of street photography before i started feeling like i'm getting somewhere with it uh, yeah so just worth mentioning john wayne photo said Listen to or read the words of the greats when they tell how many hours, miles, days, years it takes to build a body of work of super photos and how many failures and near misses they had along the way. This for me goes back to photo books as well. You flick through a book, you flick through a body of work of a photographer that is impressive and you realize that this 100 page book is actually 50 years of work. And if 100 photos have been selected from 50 years of taking photos, that really does put things into perspective of, back to my previous point, how far the learning curve is and how long it might truly take for you to make your best stuff. Which is also a nice thing because it makes me think that I don't need to rush as well. I've got the rest of my life to take photos, hopefully. So I don't need to put the pressure on myself to make anything substantial because no one cares until you make something really cool. Then people might care. So. Yeah, there's no rush to this thing, but I, I appreciate John's comment here. There are people's work and photographers we respect, but they've been doing it forever. So let's not forget that, I think. That's an important one. Before we carry on with this video, I'd just like to take a moment to share with you today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. I've been using Squarespace for years before they even became sponsors of this channel, so I highly recommend what they're doing. They are essentially the best website at making websites. Whether you're a photographer that wants to host a portfolio of work or sell a digital product or even write a blog, that's exactly what I use Squarespace for and I have done for years. I even sold my new book over on my Squarespace website. The setup was very simple. Managing the website is very easy. They have hundreds of templates to choose from. 
So if you've never made a website before and you maybe are a little bit intimidated by the process, don't be, it's very easy with Squarespace. So why not at least start a free trial and see what you think? After that, when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Mike Chudley to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. Now, let's get back to the video. Rain dog, I think that's how you say it. <laughs> the moments when you don't feel like bringing your camera, bring it. This is something I've definitely been consciously trying to do more of. And something I've started doing is, even if I know I'm not pressing the shutter button or I'm not planning on taking a photograph, is to then bring my camera. Because I'm not bringing my camera to take photos. I'm just getting used to the camera being on me. And then when something does happen, then there you go, you've got your camera, which is nice. For some people, this might not be nice at all. Some people might to just only have their camera with them when they're in the zone, they're focused and giving photography their dedicated time. But for me, I think it's, it's a nice to have always. So get used to not taking photos. I think that's fine. You don't have to go outside and take a thousand photos every time. So there's so many occasions when I walk into town or get coffee or walk to the gym. And I just have like the X100V in my pocket. Who knows what might happen? And it's just nice to have the camera on you if something does. Something I'll add to this as well, that I found when I have my camera with me all the time and I capture these like one-off moments or really mundane things, just me and my girlfriend out and about or with a family member or just little things that most people won't care about except for yourself. They end up being the photographs that you appreciate more. And there's a few photographs from last year of when I moved into this place. And I took some photos of us decorating or whatever, and just interior stuff. Meaningless photographs to everyone else. But I think in 10 years, 15 years, 25 years, they're the photographs I'm gonna appreciate more. The photographs you take in between everyday moments that don't mean anything to everyone else. They're the photographs that I think might have more meaning later on down the line, or at least have more nostalgia and that you personally appreciate. So hopefully what I've just said makes sense. I feel like I've just waffled on a little bit. Having a camera with you all the time is great because it gets you in the habit of always having it on you. Like objectively, that makes sense. But also the photographs you take in those unassuming moments might be the photographs that you appreciate long term. Mr. Ryan David said, find a mentor and take a workshop and get some non-social media feedback early slash frequently along the way. I love this point because Something I'm reminded of almost every time I'm with other photographers is the variety of opinions and thoughts that people have about photography through a conversation compared to a condensed comment on an Instagram post or a thread or a YouTube comment. Or when someone says sick tones, bro, what does that actually mean? I'm joking, obviously. I think that's very Instagram 2018. But when someone leaves a comment online, it's condensed. It has to be. That's the nature of it. But when I speak to fellow street photographers and friends, I'm always surprised by the depth of people's opinions and thoughts. So having conversations about photography in real life will always be better than it happening online. Even with a video like this, I can only say so much about something for it to be in a 10, 15, 20 minute video before you're kind of not gonna listen or you don't care or whatever. But if we were sat in a coffee shop the conversation we have about photography would be way better than it ever would be on a YouTube video, in my opinion. It'd come across way more authentically and yeah, it's just better. On that note, so I did a workshop with Matt Stewart earlier this year and being around someone so experienced and so prolific and has so many thoughts and ideas is important. But the key here and something that I think is underestimated in the world of photography or in the creative world in general actually, is people that know what good looks like and having good taste. I'm gonna give an example now, and I don't know the names of who it was, so it's okay, and maybe they won't watch this video, so whatever. So on this workshop with Matt Stewart, we were fishing at certain locations and then trying to find good subjects. And if we found a good subject, we would proceed to try and take some good photographs, obviously. At one point in the workshop, someone pointed out that someone else was carrying two suitcases. I don't know how they were carrying it or if it was interesting or not or whatever was going on with the two suitcases. But this person proceeded to take some photographs and Matt Stewart immediately went, don't do that, that's pretty boring, that's not good enough. So this person kind of just shortcutted or removed the idea of that being good because someone else told them objectively that it wasn't when that person is as experienced and has put out good work like Matt Stewart. I'm more inclined to believe his opinion of what good looks like. So if someone like that is telling you that that's not good, that gives you a great starting point. And it's all subjective. So if you think it is good, go ahead and create whatever you want to create with it. 
But those two suitcases in that example was not good enough in Matt Stewart's opinion. That set the bar, for example. His ideas of what good was was then ingrained into what we thought good was. But yeah, it is all subjective. So that you've got to take that with a pinch of salt. But as a fan of Matt Stewart's work, if Matt Stewart says this is good and this isn't good, then I'm more inclined to take that on board and make note of it. So yeah, a workshop in person with someone that's been there, done it and bought the t-shirt, but also someone that understands what good looks like, I think it's incredibly important for your photography. And it could shortcut a lot of the mistakes and errors that you're probably going to make along the way. Luke Palms said, shoot more, then shoot some more. At the end of the day, even any video I make like this or any photography forum online or any comment section, nothing beats actually doing the do. And any questions you have about any niche question, like really like shutter speeds or compositional techniques or camera settings or focal lengths and anything technical, I think if you're actually out there doing it, you'll figure it out. And something that I like to think about is a lot of my prolific friends at street photography, people that are out there all the time doing the do, they're not asking questions about how do you deal with confrontation or how do you, how, what's your technique with this or what do you do if the light's flat or they're just doing it. It's quite simple. Um, so nothing replaces actually out getting out there and taking photos. I think that's a nice thing to remember. No one's got the answer to everything. If you're out there doing it, you'll figure it out and you'll you'll come up with an answer yourself. And I think that's a, that's part of the learning curve as well. And part of the, the idea of coming up with your own style is something a lot of photographers want. And you end up coming up with your own style when you solve the problems that you encounter along the way. So just reading comments online about photography isn't enough, I think. You know, watching videos like this isn't enough. You have to actually get out there and do it and learn for yourself, I guess is the answer. I think that's enough for this video. I feel like I've rambled on a little bit. I've enjoyed talking about and thinking about photography. This has been a fun video to make. Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram threads, I might do more like this. I've got one more video to post, which is going to be one of my favorites of the entire year, hopefully. And then that's probably a wrap for 2023. Uh, but I appreciate all the support from you guys this year. The support about the book as well was amazing. Very grateful for you guys. And um, yeah, looking forward to taking more photos and talking about photography even more in 2024. So thanks for watching, everyone. I will see you next week. I've got one more video and then that'll be it for the year. So see you guys soon. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, subscribe. 100K, we're nearly on 100K. Peace.